All right, what's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Living the Dream podcast. Today on the show, we have Karu Papritz, who is an educational thought leader, literacy advocate, Guinness World Record holder, and the author of the multi-award winning book, The Legacy Letters. Karu, how are you doing? Timothy, great. And that's a mouthful. I'll give you that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. Well, thank you for coming on the show. And we like to jump right in. So if you could start you with telling us a little bit more about yourself and what you like to do for fun, that'd be great. Oh, what I like to do for fun. Well, as uh, to your listeners out there, my name is Karu Papritz. Um, I have been an author for many years. I'm a filmmaker. I was, uh, I worked in Hollywood and worked on feature films I'm definitely not doing that at the moment, uh, this moment in time. Um, I'm a husband and a father, and uh, uh, I've done a great many things in my life that I think will contribute wonderfully to this podcast and talking about how I got there. What do I love to do? I love to be outside. I love to meet people. Um, my family always says, oh, he's talking again. Why do I love to talk? It's not just talking for talking sake. I just find people so fascinating. I find places so fascinating and being outdoors in any way, shape or form, um, whether it's playing sports or if it's skiing or hiking or climbing, I don't care. As long as I'm outside, I'm, I'm a happy camper. And, um, and right now I'm uh, doing this podcast from the great city of Chicago. So we're visiting here just to visit another great American city and show my son. So it's, uh, we're having a blast. And here we are. There we go. There we go. I love it. Well, tell us a bit more about your motivation. What really gets you up and keeps you going every day? You know, I made a vow when I was 14 years old. And it's funny to A, make a vow when you're 14 and B, keep it for this many years. And it was a very, it's interesting because I, I said to myself, I want to live the most adventurous life I can. Mm -hmm. Not knowing that that doesn't mean a secure life, but that means that for every time you're, there's an old saying like you're looking over the ridge line and, and you're going, what's beyond that next ridge line and what's beyond the next one and the next one. And you're like, I'm gonna keep going in that direction because I already know what's behind me. Yeah. And so, I guess I've lived my entire life that way. And, and some, you know, people can look at it and say, oh, wow, you've lived a, a blessed life, a magical life. A da -da -da -da. I go, yeah, but it's been a very um, decisive life. And I decided to go forward rather than backwards. And that, and if I told you the, the, the security part of the story, you'd see I, I was nuts. You know, I left, um, interestingly enough, I left Hollywood. I was a, um, uh, in the union there and to get a union motion picture card is one of the toughest union cards you can get but yet i saw the writing on the wall after having worked there and i just said you know what this is a spiritual dead end so i said okay i'm done and i left it and people were slack jawed they couldn't believe it I says no man life's short really 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 short and so to answer your question the longest way possible what gets me up in the morning I am so, I am so hungry to live life all the time. Mm. And, and it sounds almost like, oh, come on, really? Seriously? No, seriously. I get up and I can't get enough of it, you know? And, and I sort of say a little prayer or blessing or a little meditation to myself, like, all right, this is going to be a great day. Let's go out. At the end of the day, sort of have a recap, you know, who did you interact with? How did you interact with them? And, and what did you do to sort of either forward yourself or forward humanity or, or, or just enjoy life that much more, one more inch more, you know? And I, it's a long way of saying it, but I think that sets the tone for, for your, what you're going after in your podcast. Yeah, no, I love it. I love that you made that commitment to yourself when you were 14 and you've kept it all these years. And so my question is, um, as a filmmaker, tell us about, the journey kind of as a filmmaker, tell us about some of that risk that you took and now what it's like as an author. Well, I should go back a bit more. I was, uh, I had published an author in my late teens, early twenties, and I had really wonderful success with that. And I sort of said, okay, what's the next great challenge? And um, 
And the good, my, actually my editor at that time said, hey, why don't you become a filmmaker? You've sort of got that mind for it. I said, all right, well, sure. And I said, what's the best film school in the world? Oh, UCLA. And of course I say that and all the people at NYU and USC and all the other film schools will go, yeah, right. Said, no, it's, it's a great film school. And so I applied for it. I was driving tour buses up in Alaska and uh, I apparently, my brother who was working up there got a call and said, hey, you got accepted to UCLA. I says, great, I got to finish the tour, which was about two weeks more. I ended up driving all the way down from Alaska all the way to UCLA. And I didn't know a soul in LA. Um, and it was interesting. It was like one of your classic ground up, you know, stories of arriving at play. Oh, I, I only had a guitar on my back and, you know, three bucks <laughs> in my pocket, right? Well, I actually had to sleep on top of the parking garage and sleep on the beaches for the first couple months because, hey, I didn't, the student money hadn't come in. They barely even knew I was there. And they said, yeah, we've got you down, but we've sort of got to find you. I was like, oh, okay, that's fine. But um, I got into the game and it was, um, what surprised me about filmmaking was how slow it was, mm. right? I mean, you look on the screen, it looks action packed, it looks full of energy, but when you, that's created, that's put together bit by bit by bit. It was a great shock to me. And it shouldn't have been because I knew about filmmaking, but um, I think for someone who loves the energy of the moment, um, it was, I, I had to find another way into it. And so eventually I came around and then I figured out how to do it. And I, um, I did it through the art department. And uh, um, I, I found what I loved about film and then, but, but that's the show and then there's the business part and that's a whole nother world. And um, even though I was fortunate enough to make my way and work, you work your way up in Hollywood. There's no doubt about it. You want those dreams, you work your bottom. And here's what's fascinating. When you start at the bottom, you never let them know you went to film school. Oh no. It's like, okay, we're gonna give him five times the amount of work. Yeah. Because, because you're, you're pampered. You're like, oh, you know, all this stuff. Oh no, you start at the bottom, like you're just pushing brooms and you know, taking out the garbage for the producer, you work your way up and, are the, and so on and so forth. Um, it's, a real, it's a real craft oriented. You're expected to learn the craft of whatever it is, position you're at and to work your way up. So um, that was fine. I, I lo absolutely loved it. But um, I definitely, after a while being in the bright lights and the glare and the, the, the speed of it and the hours, tremendous, tremendous hours working on films, I began to see that this was not a life I wanted. And so I moved on and became a cowboy. Became a cowboy. I worked on my dad, my granddad had a small ranch when I was growing up. And what's fascinating is, is I love to say this, I don't know how big a joke it'll, or a laugh it'll get, but if you're gonna have a midlife crisis, have it early. So I had it early. So I drove around the West and I was like, I don't know what to do. And people are like, what is he doing? And I, and I just wanted to land someplace. It's like my spirit, once again, was stronger than I was. Yeah. And it said, we got to get you someplace. And it put me on a ranch in Southern Arizona. And that's wild enough. Um, I, I, I was the sole hand. I was the sole cowboy. And I worked there for five years. And that's where I picked up the pen and wrote the legacy letters. So it was sort of my Walden Pond time. It was it was an amazing journey. And again, really holding true to that thing. Like I'm, I could go backwards. I could be secure. Talk about secure. Talk about like the creme de la creme of, of union cards. But I just said, man, once again, life is short. We're going that way over the ridge line. Yeah. 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 I love that. I love that. And so now I, I introduce you as an educational thought leader and Guinness world record holder. So tell us about those two. Ooh, well, I got to tell you, the educate, it's funny what the, the, the names people give you, but the educational thought leader, I think, is more with the uh, literacy work I do for kids. So here's the funny story, Timothy. The, the signing of doing book signings is really wonderful. I mean, just, just the honor of being able to do that. And then not just once or twice, but many, 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 many times and, and all over the U.S. and sometimes overseas. And so, but once again, I love to be outdoors. And I began to think about it. And I said, God, 
how can I be outdoors and do book signings? And I thought, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to do a book signing on top of the horse I got married on and I worked on. So I did it and I did it in front of Barnes and Noble and I did a digital, um, when you watch it, um, I actually did a digital book signing too and I uploaded the book. So it was the first set, I, that, uh, um, David Beckham beat me by a week to do the first ever digital book signing, really peeved me. I was gonna call him up and say, David, please, come on. I'm just the nobody, you know? <laughs> and uh, I, uh, so I did the first ever digital book signing on a horse. It was a Barnes and Noble. It was great. So I started to call these series the first, first ever book signings. So I've done it on top of Mount St. Helens, the volcano. I've done it on a glacier in Alaska. I had a um, first ever modern day whistle stop book tour. Went from um, Orlando to Niagara Falls. I would stop. I would do book signings on the train. And people are like, what are you doing? Said, well, we're having a book signing. Great. There's a little party. And uh, I've done it rafting. I've done it uh, whitewater rafting. Uh, gosh, um, I did one, the first ever book signing post um castro's death the first american book signed by an author in cuba right when they opened up which was wild so um and people say well why are you doing these things and i had a simple answer i love to walk the talk of my book which is the, the live life to the fullest yeah. so and then i got to film these things so i got to get back into filmmaking in a fun way it was very just spontaneous and then with that the educational literacy part uh, the, uh, the thought leader part is then I started a series of I love to read so I would take my book oh by the way here's the here's the pitch for the book guys boop, there it is so I would get on the back the same thing first it's funny I never even thought of this the first time I did this was on the same horse boots so I got in the back of the horse and I like this and i and I turn to the camera and I go I love to read and I love to ride and I'd spur the horse and off we would go. And that was the first one. And the first take, he farted. <laughs> Second take, he farted louder. Third take, it was just, I, so we put the whole thing in there. And that started the I love to read series. Now it's got a several million views, a whole gazillion load of subscribers. But what I love to do is get the kids and they ask questions like, why is this author doing this? And why is this guy doing this? And so it creates a whole classroom discussion about that type of stuff. So now on to the Guinness World Record part. So once again, sort of on the educational front, um, I love promoting um, cursive writing. I love promoting civility and gratitude and all these good things. And I was reading a letter from, from the book um, as a very early letter called How to Say Please and Thank You. And I was teaching this, I was writing about it while talking to our local school, um, teaching this cursive class. And all of a sudden I said to the kids, hey, what about writing a cursive letter, a handwritten thank you letter, the size of a football field? Well, these kids all blew up. They know me like, oh, it's Mr. Papperts, he'll do anything. Oh, well, let's do it. I was going, yeah, that really sounds cool until I realized how much paper that would take. Um, but we did it. 2000, November 14th, 2018, we created the world's largest handwritten thank you letter, the size of a high school basketball gym. There we go. And, yeah. it, and we started on that day, nationalthankyouletterday.com, which was so, so cool. So, um, and, and then what do you do with the world's largest handwritten thank you letter? Well, of course you have to send it. So the next year we sent it through the post office, the world's largest envelope, the world's largest stamp. We put it inside. It took about 15 students to carry it out. It's a gigantic burrito. We stuffed in the back of the postal deal. The postmaster had stamped it. I mean, it was really incredible. Sent it off to the sister school, COVID hit. Two years later, or three years, or whatever, uh, this last year, we got the Guinness World Record for it. That is amazing. <laughs> it's such a cool story, man. It is so cool. Uh, it's really, and actually right now, as of today, the Kelly Clarkson show is looking at having us on this fall. There so, we go. Crossfinger guys, that'd really be fun. But again, nationalthankyouletterday.com. Go check it out. And 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 really and truly, Timmy, I think... Timothy, one of the, the main things I love promoting it is not just writing thank you letters, it's the, the values behind it, promoting 
civility and gratitude and, and, yeah. and manners and, and kindness, which I consider sort of the four pillars of that. So, um, and people go, wow. And I say, yeah. And especially now, I think we need more of this than ever. So if it's in the guise of a thank you letter, I'm all about it. There we go. There we go. There we go. I love it. Well, awesome, man. Let's go ahead and talk dreams and goals. Now we've heard about yeah. a lot of things that you've done. Where are yeah. you going? What's your vision for your life going forward? Oh, I love those. Where are you going forward at this point? Well, of course, taking on this, I, you know, I would love to be part of the climate conversation. Mm. And um, I'm working hard on doing that vis-a-vis -vis television right now. And I'm not gonna let the cat out of the bag because I need to be on your next show when we bring that out in a big way. So, but suffice to say, it, I want to approach it in a way with a little bit of humor and you're going, how can you do it with humor? Trust me, there's a way to do it. And to not only bring it in with humor, but also have solutions that everyone can buy into. Because I think what I see in the climate conversation is so much gloom and doom that at the end of something, you just feel like, well, I'm just going to go and hang myself right now. You know, it's, oh my gosh. So I'm very much a solution oriented person. I get the knowledge, I figure it out, and then what can we do with it? And there's a lot of people doing a lot of amazing things out there. So instead of write a letter to your congressman, you know, like, yeah, right. No, let's get on board with these, these amazing people doing amazing things to help the planet and to help ourselves. So um, I would really love to take that on. I, I feel very passionate about that. And I feel like I've, I've, um, worked hard to get a good voice into the world about things that are important. And so I feel like I can continue that further afield. There we go. There we go. So be, be part of, be a part of the climate conversation and putting it yeah. on television. Yeah. Any other dreams or goals that you want to chat about? Oh my gosh. Oh my God. I've been a, um, a mountaineer all my life. I was raised in, in Washington state. So I, uh, around, Lots of mountains. I've skied and mountaineered, rock climbed all my life. And um, and now my son, who's 16, he loves all of it. And so I, 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 I can climb and ski until the cows come home and then some, you know, leave me on top of a mountain type of deal, you know, when I'm gone. Yeah. But I, that's how much I love it. Um, I've got a lot of mountains. I don't know. Gosh, there's so many mountains. It's just, uh, it sounds like, you know, for someone who, I met this guy once he was, he was trying to hit all the, the baseball stadiums, you know, in the U S it was, it was a funny conversation, it was, but it was more of us like, yeah, why not? Why not try to hit them all or soccer I, stadiums? Here. I feel like I had them on the podcast recently. Did you? I wouldn't be surprised. I think I did. I, Al remember, I can't remember his name, yeah. Right but yeah, I remember somebody saying, I've been trying to hit all the baseball stadiums. Yeah, I think it's the same guy. I ran, I forgot where I ran across. It was a great conversation. And it's that same sort of like, wow, people are amazing. I mean, when they have these goals and I think that's what really lights me up is when, is when people, and it's not the, the grandiosity so much of the goal as it is the, the passion behind it. Yeah. I mean, it can, and of course we say that, but when I say passion, um, I, uh, I've got a good friend of mine who loves rattlesnakes. I mean, can you imagine loving, I mean, li literally goes out and studies them and, and he doesn't have a degree in it, but he loves it so much that he goes out and studies mother rattlesnakes and the babies and how they relate. And he's actually... He's a world leader in discovering how mothers have feelings for their babies with rattlesnakes. And I'm just like, John, you're probably going to have to have him on the podcast. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> but I mean, that type of that love of, I don't care what it is. I'm, I'm buying in. I'll great. Tell me about, tell me about you and your love of whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense that you buy into that because it lines right up with your kind of living life to the fullest and getting all the adventure out of life because i feel like when people are pursuing their passions there's an energy behind oh, that yeah. that only comes when you are being the most adventurous that you can in life yeah yeah so, makes sense yes about yeah that. yeah and, and isn't it isn't it 
when you realize sort of how uh, fragile the time that you have, you know, there's a, one of the things I love to talk to people about when writing a letter and they say, oh, I can send a text, I can send an email. And I said, wait a second. When you write a letter, you actually put your time into the letter. Yeah. And so if the greatest gift that you're given in life is the time you have on this planet, then the gift that you're giving to somebody is your time. And they're holding that time in their hands. And people are like, wow, I never thought of it that way. I says, yeah, that's why it's so powerful. That's why people, when there's a fire, what do they grab? You know, you grab your kids, your pet, wait, your pets, your kids, I don't know, we made that order, whichever. <laughs> your, your photographs and your letters. I've got to remember, because you can't replicate those again. What are you going to grab? Your emails? You're going to grab your text message? No, never. Yeah. No. Yeah. So it is that time. And that's, I guess it's, when you wake up and you say it's that precious, and it really is. And that's, I guess that's how I view it, man. I just can't get enough of it. I love it. I love it. Well, awesome. So being part of the climate conversation, putting on television, what are the top one to two skills that you're going to need to develop to make that come to fruition like you want it to? Well, you're up against sort of the business and politics of it but that's you know once again it's like anything with dreams if you if you immediately think that there's a boundary then there's a boundary right i mean you're not going to go overcome it so that aside you know you just jump in you jump into it but the skills you have to develop i would say hmm, that's a great question i i think it's more I don't know if it's the skills because I have the skill set in the background to be able to pull it off. I think it's what it's going to take is the perseverance. It's going to take the clarity in explaining to people why it's important and why I'm important, why I should do it and not somebody else. I think that's going to be part of the equation and, and then convince and then i've got a of course i have to shoot a couple of these pilots um we're already working on that to do there be a half hour type of deal um and show them that because it's one thing to say it it's another thing to see it and when you see it you're like oh it works so i actually have to see it work and that's that's where i'm at so a particular skill set i think it's pulling all the skills together and really keeping it focused. And then, you know, I, I probably have right now written out 50, 60 different episodes um, ready to go. Yeah, so that's yeah. great. Um, it's just getting it off the ground like anything else and hopefully it can catch on fire. So, yeah. There we go. There yeah. we go. I love it. I heard um, the keep it focused part and also the communicating the vision. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's great. Yes. I like that. Yeah. yeah communicating your vision I, I think and and of course the walking your talk right I think it's one thing in this day and age when it's just easy to to well to talk to talk it to text it to do whatever or put it on YouTube or it's, it's like no but guys you've really got to have a track record it's uh, catching lightning in a bottle and becoming an influencer or whatever you know that's I mean that happens but really it's and you know, you know as well as I do, it you just got to put in the footwork, you got to put in the time, you got to put in the interview. It takes a it takes a while. And then once you do it, once you have that um base, it's like running a marathon. What do they say? You just got to put in a long, deep base of miles, and then you can pick up the speed and faster and faster and faster. And it really does work like that. Yeah. So I think that's where I'm at with this. So yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, a lot of people, specifically Alex Hormozzi and Myron Golden recently said to me, they're like, everybody is trying to wonder like what need, what they need, what they need to kind of go to that next level and, you know, really impact people and really do this and do that. He was like, be good. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> like just actually be good. Like go put in the time yeah. and develop the skills. Oh, I love that. I love that. I'm, I'm going to take that. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. And what does it take to be good? It takes time. And I think in this day and age when everything is so instantaneous, like, oh, we can get that. It's like, guys, ah, it doesn't work that way, right? Yeah. Where do they yeah. say in baseball, you gotta you gotta hit the ball a million times or shoot the hoops up, you know, a million times or or whatever it is, or throw the football a million times. And then that muscle memory, I think that too is part of this game. Yeah, that's how you get good. You have to do it over and over and over again. Put in the reps. Put in the yeah, reps. put in the reps. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Well, what are, speaking of the reps, what <laughs> are the highest impact daily actions that will tick the needle forward for you when it comes to getting in the conversation, the environment, or yes, Clim the climate conversation? Um, I would I would say not only the climate conversation, but I'd say in general, I think it is, I think we squirrel around a lot in our daily lives, or we put off, you know, tomorrow what we can do today. I think, I think if you take the baby steps, if you say, look, I'm going to put it a half an hour to this three times a week, you know what it's a lot like, it's a lot like that New Year's, uh, you know, when you say at the beginning of the New Year, all right, I'm going to work out and you do it for three weeks and then you stop because you do it every single day and you do too much of it as opposed to taking bite-sized steps. So usually I say, hey, go work out half an hour, three times a week and you can always do more, right? In a sense, less is more because you'll want to do more. So with that being said, for me, when I take on uh, large projects of any sort, I make sure I cut out the time and it's focus time. Like nothing gets in the way of that, whether that's a half an hour day, an hour or two hours um, and really make that sacrosanct. I mean, it's above all else, no one touches that time. I mean, it's like a workout thing. It's like eating a meal. It's like practically like breathing. And I love to do it early. I went, I think that's one of the keys if you're an early riser. I think you can even, you know, sometimes I roll out of bed and I just go and take, get a three mile run in. And then I got it. I'm done. I'm done. I win. I'm already ahead of the game. Yeah. Before I've had a first cup of coffee or whatever. And I just feel great. I feel fantastic. People say, oh yeah, that's because you've got so much energy. You're such a go-getter. You don't No, But I tell you that you're training yourself to do that. And I think that's critical to any dream, big or small, is really those is carving out focused time and sticking to it yeah. bar none bar none i love it there we go well if there were one or two people that you could meet right now and this could be a specific person or a type of person and they'd really help you take the next step towards this dream <laughs> of the climate conversation on tv who would they be and how would they help <laughs> Oh, these great, these great podcaster, podcaster questions, which I know you sit up all night and think about. Um, let me see. Oh, I think, I think like with anything of a creative nature where you're going to be trusting somebody to be good, you also want to find your equivalent on the other side that sees the merit of what you've done. Like, wow, this cat has a background. He walks his talk. And so I, and, and I, <laughs> I really believe in putting it out there in the universe. You know, people thought, oh, it's the, the woo woo stuff, but no, it really is. Cause I oh, believe no, that really if you, is. yeah, it really, thank you. It really is <laughs> because I don't even think it's almost you know, it's, it's funny. It's all God helps those who help themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't help yourself, you know, what's that? It's that, oh, what is that funny? There's that funny joke about, you know, this guy's about a lottery ticket and he goes, you know, God, you know, please help me win this lottery ticket. And then, you know, the next day he buys another, God, please help me. And he says, God, please help, or please help me buy it. Or no, God, I got to, I, I can't tell a joke to save my life. He says, I really want to, God, I really want to win the lottery. I want it. And he says like three times in a row. And then God comes down and says, help me out here, man. You got to buy a ticket. <laughs> okay, good. Thank, thank you for laughing. That wasn't a fake laugh, but it was, <laughs> Jeez. Such a bad thing. So I think that's part of it, putting out there in the universe to help yourself. Yeah. Um, believing in yourself and then not 
taking no for an answer. How simple is that? And one of my favorite sayings um, that comes from the book is, um, is I, 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 oh gosh, it's a, such a favorite saying, I forgot it. Um, <laughs> I like um, um, about being comfortable. Oh, I feel uncomfortable being comfortable. Mm. Okay. That is really oh. good. I've heard get comfortable with being uncomfortable, but no, I feel no. uncomfortable with being comfortable. That hits different. Right here, man. Right here, River City. Pick this up. All sorts of good stuff in there. All right. Shameless. <laughs> shameless. No, I, that, and that's true. And I, I really believe that because anytime I'm like, oh, this, oh, like, uh oh, no, no, you're not putting it out there. You're not getting that, like, oh, this is so much work. Oh, my gosh. That's it, isn't it? So you got it right. That's pushing it forward. If I'm not feeling uncomfortable, I didn't really answer your question about the person or how to get that, that singular person. But I think that's part of putting it out there. And you're like, every day you just put one more. Oh, that's the other thing, right? One every day, one small thing like, okay, I'm going to write a letter to so-and-so I'm going to contact so-and-so and you get a rejection. Great. The, you know, and that's another one I, uh, about, um, here's a great, another great from the book. I start with no. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I hear no. I'm like, oh, please don't say no to me because you're going to motivate me. Yeah. Really? I mean, I'm just like, seriously, you're going to say no? Oh, that, that's really not what I want to hear. Please say yes. And we're going to say it's both a lot of work. But no is like, really? Everyone says no. That's so easy. That's just, that's a cop out. So no for me is like, oh yeah, okay. Moving on the next one, next one, next one. Cause I'm going to come to a yes eventually. doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I love it. Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. Well, now we're going to jump into our thriving three. Okay. And the first question is what's your favorite book, movie, or podcast? Pick one. Oh, okay. So politically, my favorite podcast is your podcast, no, okay. <laughs> um, it is my first time on it. I hope it's not my last, so that would be wonderful. Um, favorite book? Oh, and if I say shamelessly, I love this book. I do. Uh, I and and guys, this book is the appetizer to the legacy letters complete. I, it's already finished. It's six hundred letters, but I had to bring out something smaller so people could get a taste of what it was like, but the, the big book's coming out next. So that's when you can have me back on your show and then we'll do it again. There but right. um, but favorite book, favorite book, I'm a Hemingway sucker. I love Hemingway. I love his being able to cram so much of being a human being into three or four words. So um, he definitely less is more uh, for whom the bell tolls, if I was going to say that. I'm a, I'm a classicist in that way. I love um, The Godfather just because of the filmmaking and it's a great story. And you know, what's, you know what's funny? When Coppola took the book, it was a real reggae book. Um, and it, meaning it was just a, it was a pot boiler. It wasn't a, it wasn't a literary book. And that was the best part of it because he took and he, he could create, that's what great filmmakers do. They take something that's, that the essence of greatness is in there and then they, they put their own spin on it, right? They put their own light and creativity and, and just everything into it. So I, I love that in the way he did that. Um, yeah, uh, and I love Robert Frost in his poems. Mm. You know, we don't talk a lot about poetry anymore, but the power of poetry, I, I'm always amazed at how much a poet can teach us about both simultaneously having our feet on the ground and our head in the stars. Yeah. And, and, and a great poets can do that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there we go. And what's one way you like to take care of yourself? I'll say that again. What is one way you like to take care of yourself? Oh, take care of yourself. Um, stop, stop mm -hmm. doing stuff. Stop and just smell the roses. Stop, take a moment, literally timeouts. I really practice taking daily timeouts and going, wow, I am here. 
with this person looking and I'm enjoying this. I'm, this is a rainy day or a sunny day or a snowy day. And, and just a lot of these little timeouts just to say, I'm glad I'm here. So yeah, I take care of myself that way. Like when I get, you can get so wound up, right? Oh, this is so important, really. Well, being right here, breathing, you're above ground, you're vertical, and you've got love in your heart. You can give to others, hopefully, and hopefully you can receive it. And you're aware of all the gifts that you're being given and the gifts that you can give. And I think that and at any given moment, if you can stop and say, yeah, that's a good thing. Okay. There we go. There yeah. we go. Yeah, I'm a yeah. big fan of the power of now. I think power now. Yeah, thank you. Touched on that right there. What is one action step that you can take right now or continue to take if you're already doing it to meet that counterpart that really sees mm. and appreciates your work and has like the skill to do it? Man, always coming up with these questions. Yeah, you said I was going to be uncomfortable, and I said I love being uncomfortable. Now I really don't like it. So, oh. <laughs> um, I think it's really putting it out there more. Mm. I think, I you know, Timothy, I think sometimes we get so good about forgetting where we've come from. And what I mean by that is, some, and your question prompts that. It's like, you know what, buddy, look at yourself in the mirror, remember what it took to get you to where it was and go back to that. Sometimes we're turning to the basics, right? Yeah. And so with that being said, I think what I really need to do is, you know, back in focus and, and not one a day, not two a day, three a day that go out, you know, yeah. and start throwing that out there. Um, because I think that will accelerate that. And again, that 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 from the heart from the soul from passion um something will happen because i have all the, the elements set up i think it's just a matter of that focus again there we go yeah there we go. all righty we're gonna jump into our final series of questions now okay here we go wait let me take a deep breath <laughs> okay i'm ready <laughs> all right i didn't send these beforehand they tend to get a little personal so if you ever don't want to answer one just be okay. like i want to pass okay okay, okay i want to pass no i'm sorry Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> all right i'm ready i'm ready all right now you lost your privileges to pass no. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny <laughs> okay. awesome what is one limiting belief that continues to pop up in your life if any Pass. No, I can't think. I can't. It's not, there's not a limiting belief. It's that when, when I start to get the tickle of wanting to put a wall up mm. that I immediately remember, look what you're doing. And I go, okay, fine. So being very conscious of that, that thing that that doesn't want to be uncomfortable because, oh, if I only put that little wall up, then I wouldn't have to deal with this. And if you don't have to deal with it, you won't be uncomfortable. And I'm like, really? You're really walking your talk now, buddy. So yeah, that one right there. Just the yeah, tickle yeah. of that and pulling that wall down as fast as possible. So putting a wall up to not be uncomfortable is- Putting, oh, you're saying the limiting factor. Yeah, but it's almost like putting the first brick up. Yeah. It's literally like, oh, here's a brick. Why are you putting a brick there? You know, you're not, okay, 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 I won't put the brick. Okay, I won't, that's it. So it's only one brick, but it's still a brick. You know, it's like, and maybe, maybe that's part of the, the action. Maybe you need to put it up there to take it down, right? Maybe, I don't maybe. know. I think, I think that might be a personal thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would, um, you know, actually I'm about to ask about that. Okay. So first, before I ask about that, where do you think that desire comes from which desire the thought the tickle that comes up the thought that comes up that says i don't want to be uncomfortable let's start putting that brick up to build the world. oh golly i don't think that's i think that's just being human i think that's just i think it's fear right that's fear mm -hmm. plain and simple it's like oh here's a fear brick let's put it up there oh that feels good really well you can go around it you can go over it you can go under it but it made you feel good it's almost like a 
it's almost like having a teddy bear. Oh, can I hold the teddy? Yeah, you can hold it, but you still have to, you still have to walk through the, the middle of the woods. Yeah, okay, as long as I have my, you know, it's funny. I taught climbing um, for a number of years, rock climbing. And I, one gal I had, she was scared to death, but she was going to do it. And so she'd go up maybe even six feet. I was on a top rope, it comes down. And, you know, I've got her, I'm blaying her. And she goes to me, goes, I want down, I want down. I said, do you really want down? She goes, no, I really don't want down. I just want to be able to say I want down. And I said, okay, I'll make you a deal. When you say it five times, I'm bringing you down. So she kept going up and up and up and up. And she would say it four times. I said, okay, one more. And it's, it's, we're coming down. She goes, I know, I know. I, uh, you know. And then the time, it was like, she said it five times, you know, clicked her heels five times. Said, I don't want to. And I said, fine, you did it. And she was 50 feet off the ground. You know, yeah. it was really cool. But I think in some ways that that's almost the brick thing. You almost like, I just need it to know that I can do it, but you really don't need it. But I don't know. It's a, you really opened up a little uh, can of worms here, brother. Let me tell you. This is, <laughs> thank you. I really appreciate it. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. No, of course, man. Of course. <laughs> God, man. All uh, the, right. the, the question, the next question was going to be about actions. And if you have any actions that may have, maybe they happen on a daily basis, a weekly, monthly, maybe it's sporadic, maybe it's once a year, but any actions that reinforce that tickle. So it's like from that fear, some small action happens. Is there any of that in your life? Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't because you made the decision at 14 to combat yeah. that. A lot of no, but but this this is a really fascinating little thing you got to go in my head because I, I haven't visited fear in this way in a long time. So I really think um, when you think about love and hate, you know, people say, well, love's really powerful. It can move the world. I says, yeah, but hate can really move it and move it fast, you know? So in, in some respects, that's the fear factor. So I think having a, um, I think having, for me, Timothy is, the, I know it's the fear of not living life enough. That is a real fear. Yeah. And, and not, not accomplishing enough. It's like, I, I am like a man in the desert constantly. I was like, what, why? Because I don't want to miss out on anything. I, it's funny. I read this thing about, oh, not John Bonham. That was Led Zeppelin. Uh, Rolling Stones, the guitarist. Um, oh God, jeez. Okay. <laughs> uh, Ronnie, uh, that's the drummer. Uh, and he, and he, it was funny because he said, the, the, it was like a Rolling Stones magazine. He says, you know, um, we heard that you stayed up eight days once. And he goes, yeah, I heard that too. And he goes, well, how did you do it? And he says, oh, I probably had to do it through drugs. And, you know, I'm like, and, I, and the, but why? He goes, because I didn't want to miss a thing. And I was like, okay, not a big fan of drugs, but I'll tell you what. Okay. I get it, you know, yeah. I get that, like, I, if that's what it takes, you know, of course, I'm not going to do it, but it's that same sort of, I don't want to miss a thing. I don't want to miss it. It's all too short. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting because from that perspective, a lot of your actions would reinforce that. Yeah. Yeah. But then there's a, there's a little nuance there as well, because actions towards love are also actions away from fear. Beautifully put. And Beautifully so put. Yes. The, the intent there is really yeah. hard to like, because you are moving away from fear, but is it because you're moving away from fear or is it because you're moving towards love? And I feel like that's where the core battle starts to happen. And, and I do. And I think it really, for me, it is more love. I, but, I, I agree. But, I right? So yeah. yeah. Definitely for right. you. Right. But if someone's not, but, but it's almost like lighting the own, your own fire behind you, right? Like, okay. Yeah. I can feel it. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Satchel Paige, the, the, the um, baseball player, he said something about, you know, um, I'm going forwards, but I'm always looking over my shoulder to make sure, you know, it's not coming <laughs> up on me. And it's like, well, what's coming up on you? He goes, you know what it is. You know, it's like death. Right. So yeah. yeah I, 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 yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good, 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 
good thinking here, man. You're really putting it into, you're stirring the pot. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, we already touched on this a little bit, but I just want to get really clear on it. If okay. you were to kind of, so when that tickle comes up and you yeah. like have the thought of starting to put up that one brick, what okay. is the like abundant phrase, the loving phrase that you say to yourself that speaks to your heart, stops you from doing it? Hmm. Um, why, you know, why are you putting the brick up? Um, I think we get into the habit of putting bricks up. So how do you break a habit? You, you consciously have to say no or why or whatever it is that stops you in your tracks and makes you, you know, why am I doing this action? Yeah. Essentially. So I think that's it. I think that's the, anytime that comes up, if you can stop yourself and say, well, why am I doing the same bad thing over and over again? Well, walk yourself through it and then, and then walk it back and take another direction. I mean, um, you know, psychologists do this with people who say they have fear of flight and they build an, an, instead of concentrating on the fear, they build a new neural bridge with positive reinforcements around it. So I think that's the same here. I'm going to put the brick down. Why are you putting the brick down? Because you're afraid of what? You're afraid of it's going to be a lot of work. You're afraid of getting called embarrassed. It's like really all the things that you overcome all your life. And yeah. So what is this little brick? It's like, Okay, just give me, let me have one brick. Is that okay? Can I have one brick just to, yes, you can have a brick, Carew, calm down. Yes, you can have your stupid little fear brick. Does that make you, yes, it makes me feel better. Thank you. <laughs> now I can move on? Yes, now you can move on. Okay. I, did I answer your question? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, right. I, I like that answer a lot. I like All that right. answer a lot. We got one last question for you. Okay. Is this it? Is this the big one? This is... This is the big one for me. I think we got through all the big ones for you. All right. okay. I really like this question and okay. I want to frame it before I ask it. So Alex okay. Rosie said that the difference between manipulation and help is intent. So in both scenarios, you are influencing people, mm -hmm. but there's a difference in intent there. Mm -hmm. And there's a common saying that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't, can't make, make it, drink. it drink. I use it all the time with my son. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> I actually found out from Dr. Alan Leica, he was a guest on the show, that you can make a horse drink. You just have to salt its oats. Very interesting. Yes. yes. But you really can't force a horse. You can't. It's really, I'm trying to trust. <laughs> so yeah. anyway, off, on a tangent, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I want you to think of a person with a really fixed mindset, not willing okay. to accept help, not willing to accept change. They're discontent with their life. They, they're not liking it. Okay. We can't actually make them drink the water. Like you said, mm -hmm. they have to make that choice, but how can we create an environment to salt their oats and help them change their life? Salting oats, changing lives. I really like the story approach. And what I mean by that, I think it almost one of the things I discovered with the, the writing of these letters and the legacy letters was the when I originally started, I wrote the first hundred pages by hand. And these and for your your listeners, the real quick, the legacy letters is a series of letters written by a father to his kids he would never live to see. And these letters become their practical, moral, and spiritual guidebook for the rest of their life. And I thought the initial idea of this father not being around, leaving behind these letters was great. So I wrote these letters and I got done with it. And I wrote them all sort of out of sequence and put them all together and sat down one night with a, with a Cup, a glass of good bourbon and I thought, okay i'm gonna read the whole thing through and i'm 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 because i wrote them they're going to be brilliant right that's you know that's that's how it works when you're an author or if you're a writer oh, this is it this is the moment and i read it and i got done and i wish i had an entire bottle of bourbon and i wish i had a lighter because i would have lit the whole thing on fire <laughs> it was horrible it was horrible and why was it horrible because of this finger wagging knowledge, right? So 
I had to incorporate the storytelling. And then there's this whole metamorphosis within the book um, about how the father relates. I mean, he brings in the grandfather and he ends up on a cabin in this mountain and he, this is where he dies. I mean, you can, you, can, you can read it all and all this good stuff. But, but what I discovered is the power of the story to relate this knowledge I wanted to get across. Bible does it all the time. Um, great literature does it all the time. And watch this. You listen to someone in a lecture hall, a good, a good lecture. And I've done this before. And I, and I'll say, I'll be talking about something. I say, you know what? I want to tell you a, 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 a small story. You can visibly watch people settle in. Yeah. It's the darndest thing because why there's something in our DNA that wants us to hear a story. Yeah. And, and so to answer your question in the longest way possible, as opposed to finger wagging to somebody because they hear that it's gone. But if you tell a story to somebody and you do it in a way that makes them think the greatest compliment that I can get when I'm trying to achieve this with somebody that I know is in this position, they're intransigent, they can't get out of there. And so I sort of give them an alternate way of looking at the universe, but I come through it by a story. And I have lots of examples, but I, that there's, but it really, really works because in the end run, they go, huh, I never thought of it like that. Mm. And I'm like, then I've done my job. Yeah. I've done my job because I'm not going to force you to drink. I'm going to make you, I'm going to get you to think about drinking and how good that water's going to taste. Yeah. But if I say, you need to drink, it's like, I'm not drinking that because you told me to drink it. It's like, okay, man, we're all, that's fine. There we go. Oh, yeah. so good. So good. So good. I, this is good stuff. This is good. <laughs> You're good. These are good questions, by the way. I really, I really like them, and I really like the give and take, and the, uh, I, 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 I love great conversation, you know. And this is this is that. Crew, mm. thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> My pleasure, man. Well, awesome. That is all we have for you. So, is there anything else that you want to chat about before we sign off? I, yes, I want to say one more important thing. I want to ask. What motivates you? Mm. What motivates you to do these podcasts? I'm curious, genuinely. <laughs> so I think the initial motivation was me going towards things that gave me energy. So I was pretty miserable in life probably a year and a half ago. And I had made a commitment to myself when I was 19, 20 to not do things that I hated to do that I didn't want to do. Like there'd right. be some things that, you know, I don't want to do and I need to do them. Like I'll have to change my baby's diaper one day. Probably won't want to do it, but I also want to take care of my child. So there's like a superior want that yeah, yeah. supersedes the temporary not want, but there are some things that we do for people we don't like who don't care about us and we don't like. Mm -hmm. And I made a commitment to myself to not do those things and found myself post-graduation doing a lot of those things. And so I wrote, I sat down, and I wrote down all the things that gave me energy and all the things that drained my energy. Oh, I like that. Yeah. And the one yeah. thing that gave me energy that was like practical, tangible outside of like working out and hanging out with my girlfriend at the time, now fiance, um, was like talking to people about their dreams and goals. Yeah. And so then I asked myself, okay, how can I do this every day? Mm -hmm. Hence the podcast that runs daily. And so wow. I started the podcast and a lot of why that gives me energy is because when I was 14, I was living other people's lives mm -hmm. and I was miserable. And I was like, this is a lot of unnecessary suffering. And I also felt like my family went through a lot of unnecessary suffering. Mm -hmm. So now I'm kind of on a journey for the rest of my life to help as many people as I can journey away from unnecessary suffering. Wow. I sign me up. <laughs> Sign me up. Whatever you need, I'm there for you because I love what you're doing. Yeah. This is great. This is great stuff. And I'm I'm so glad that we met. And I'm I I, I mean that anytime 
Gosh, this is good, good stuff. And I'm glad I asked that question. I'm glad I didn't give you a way out. So it was <laughs> turn about as fair play, my friend. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I'm glad. I'm glad you um asked it too. Glad we met. Glad you came on the show, man. Yeah, likewise. So awesome. yeah, sounds great, Timothy. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you for coming on the show. If you guys are listening to this and you loved what Carew had to say, make sure to follow him. Be on the lookout for when his show. Is it going to be a show or a movie? I guess you can't tell. Oh, no, show. Yeah, show. Oh, yeah, because you have 60 episodes. So yeah. for when his show airs, um, go ahead and share it on social media because I'm sure there will be a big announcement. Share this podcast because I'm sure he'll be back on it. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you guys for watching. We'll see you on the next show. On that note, we're out.